Okay, so first lesson in EKGs. EKGs are used all over medicine and they are an incredible diagnostic tool. They record electrical activity of the heart, providing a record of the cardiac electrical activity. And from that, we've been able to, over the years, identify some valuable information about the heart's function and structure. It's known by the letters EKG, electrocardiogram, sometimes noted as ECG. You should know that some people were experimenting with electricity. When they experimented with electricity, they noticed that when you shock a muscle, it would contract. They did this to deceased muscles from things that they were dissecting and realized that, you know, maybe there is an electrical current that is responsible for the heartbeat because it is a muscle very similar to muscles in the rest of our body. And then the EKG was born in 1901. So here's the first important thing. Einthoven named the waves of each cycle alphabetically, starting with P, then Q, R, S, and finally T. The EKG records the electrical activity of the heart, providing a record of cardiac electrical activity. There also exists an ECG and EEG that is different, a similar recording of electrical activity, but for the brain, not for the heart. So we're gonna stick with EKG. The EKG most commonly gets printed on a paper strip that is lined with boxes, a sort of really fine graph paper. And that's important because it gives us a reference point for both amplitude and time. Now the EKG records the electrical activity of the contraction. There's electrical potential when a muscle contracts. So we're only able to record contractions. That's what these spikes are. Now looking at my poorly drawn cross section of the heart, we have the left atrium, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, and the right atrium. The three lead or most basic EKG that we find is trying to capture most closely the electrical activity of contraction of the heart muscle, the myocardium, at these three points. Being able to measure the amount of contractions over a period of time gives us critical information about the heart's rate as well as rhythm. The heart muscle cell in its normal state or resting potential is just filled with negative charges as it has a negative resting potential. Now, typically speaking, the heart muscle cells or myocytes are negatively polarized. By polarized, I mean away from zero. You can be polarized positively or you can be polarized negatively. We find that the heart muscle cells are negatively polarized. When they are depolarized, they go from their resting potential zone of normally negative, they shoot across zero and become depolarized as they approach zero and then hyperpolarized towards the positive before they return to their resting potential. That is to say that normally there are a bunch of negative charges that can be found in the myocytes or cells of the heart muscle. And when the contraction happens, they are depolarized by a wave of positivity. They depolarize, they contract, and then they return to resting potential. Now, back to our heart diagram. The muscle here is illustrated in red. That's this guy over here. And when this wave of depolarization, this wave of positivity comes through, this guy contracts and squeezes and decreases the volume in this area, the right atrium, and forces the blood into 
the right ventricle. Increasing pressure in the right atrium forces the blood to fill up the right ventricle. Now going back to our charges, these charges absolutely communicate cell to cell and conduct this depolarization throughout all of the muscle tissue. It's carried mostly by fast moving sodium. That's represented by Na with a plus because by itself it is positively charged. So now on to the depolarization wave. We have a spike, we have a spike, and a bubble. Depolarization happens here. The spike represents the depolarization of the cells, while the bubble signifies repolarization. Depolarizations is when the interiors of the cells become positive, whereas repolarization is when the cells return to their normal state of being negative. Repolarization is technically initiated as soon as the cell is depolarized and is the cell's way of recovering. These things happen very quickly and in a very small range of electrical activity. So we put very expensive devices like cardiac monitors to see this change in electrical activity over time. With a finely tuned device, we can see exactly what we're looking for. As the positive ions flow through the myocytes, we see this characteristic part of the spike, an upward deflection on the EKG. So no, when you see an upward spike on an EKG, that is the phase of depolarization. We'll talk about the second half of this later. Now back to another one of my poorly drawn hearts. We're pretty familiar with pacemakers that people get when they have a weak heart, and what that pacemaker does is very similar to what ours does. That pacemaker generates electrical activity that prompts our heart to pump. And the way that it does that is very similar to the way that our body naturally does that for all the people who don't have pacemakers. It stimulates the atria to contract as this circular wave of positivity that it shoots out depolarizes the cells. The activity of the sinoatrial node is responsible for what we know as sinus rhythm, the normal cardiac rhythm. And the generation of these waves are automatic. And there are other areas of the heart that have the same automaticity that the sinoatrial node has, and those are called automaticity foci. The sinoatrial node generates regular intervals to pace the heart. And this wave of positivity travels outward to the rest of the heart depolarizing every cell it comes to contact with. It's a ripple effect, kind of like when you throw a stone into the water. Both atriums then contract at the same time, because this happens very quickly, and that shows up on the EKG as the P wave. When we see the P wave on the EKG, we know we are looking at atrial depolarization. This is a simultaneous contraction of both atria contracting. Now you might have been wondering on my terrible drawing what these little flaps are. And these little flaps are the atrioventricular valves. There's two of them, one on the right side and one on the left side. So when the atrium contract, they squeeze the blood through these one-way valves into the ventricles. The one on the left of the patient is the mitral valve, while the one on the right of the patient is the tricuspid. What we'll find if we look more closely is that the mitral valve is made out of two flaps, while the tricuspid valve is made out of three. These both prevent backflow. They are one-way valves 
and they pose a sort of electrical barrier between the atria and the ventricles. So together, these are termed the atrioventricular valves. Remember, we're looking at the patient. And what we have here is that the oxygen-depleted venous blood enters the right atrium. Atrial contraction forces the blood through this valve, which we call the tricuspid valve. And this blood comes out of the ventricle and goes to the lungs. Now the blood gets oxygen in the lungs and it re-enters on the left atrium. It passes through this valve right here when the atrium contracts, that is the mitral valve, and then leaves the ventricle to go to the body. It might be helpful to understand that the blood leaves the right ventricle, that's right here, and goes to the lungs by way of the pulmonary artery, whereas the blood that goes to the body leaves the left ventricle, that's right here, and goes to the body by way of the aorta. Remember, the tricuspid valve is on the right side, and the mitral valve is on the left side. Remember now that both atria contract simultaneously, and then shortly after, both ventricles contract simultaneously also. So when the atria contract, we notice this P wave that we talked about earlier. Then after that, there is a short pause. This is when the depolarization of the atrioventricular node slows down. This allows time for the blood to move from the atria to the ventricles. Remember that both too fast and too slow can be bad. There is still a positive wave traveling through, but it is much slower. And that is because it is carried by calcium ions, noted as Ca2+. Now, with the valves here kind of forming an insulation barrier on both sides, the AV node is the only way for electrical activity to go from the atrial side down into the ventricular side. It is the only electrical conduction pathway. Hopefully you still follow this diagram. We're trying to connect the mechanical activity with the electrical activity. This is pure physiology and I understand it can be difficult. So feel free to ask questions or go back and rewatch. Continuing with electrical activity, it is important to note the following structures. We have the atrioventricular node. We have the bundle of his, that's H-I-S. We have the left bundle branch, and we have the right bundle branch. Now the AV node is known to be slow, but as soon as it reaches the ventricular conduction system, which is everything else pictured here, it travels at super speed. This begins at the bundle of his and then travels to the left and right bundle branch. These little fibers that we have on the end here, on both sides, are known as the Purkinje fibers. These fibers distribute the depolarization wave to the rest of the myocytes in the ventricles that are left. Depolarization of the entire ventricle myocardium produces a very characteristic wave on the EKG that we know as the QRS complex. Depolarization of the ventricular myocardium records this QRS complex. So we understand that is happening if we see the QRS. So now that we're refining things, we are going to blame the slow conduction of the AV node on the fact that it uses calcium ions to conduct. And the speed of the rest of the system is because of sodium ions. 